Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson, and it is August 16th, 2016. Hey, can we talk energy again? I know the price of oil has a lot of people confused about where we really are in the energy story, but price is hiding the true story. I've often said that that we're so immersed in energy on a daily basis, it's really difficult to detect just how much it does for us. It's like water to a fish. So we're surrounded by energy each day, energy slaves, really, silently doing our bidding, whether we're aware of them or not. And these slaves give us the easiest possible daily lives compared to people of times past. Some say we live like kings, but that doesn't really go far enough. Uh, Henry VIII may have had complete mastery over his many wives, but even he could not click a mouse, buy a plane ticket, and be halfway around the world the next day. You and I can do that. So we really live like ancient Greek gods, you know, able to command the forces of nature and get ourselves from point A to point B really quickly if we choose. So let's not take this moment in human history lightly. Let's have gratitude for the immense abundance in our lives. And let's also be clear about where we really stand in this story. To gain that perspective, we could do no better than to focus on the lowly truck, the true workhorse of modern times. And to help us bring that breed of stock vehicle into focus for us is Alice Friedman, the creator of EnergySkeptic.com and the author of the new book, When Trucks Stop Running, Energy and the Future of Transportation. And she really knows trucks and transportation through a 22-year career at American President Lines where she developed computer systems to keep cargo seamlessly moving around the globe and just in time between ships, rail, trucks, and customers. Welcome, Alice. Good to be here. So uh, where should we start in this story? I'm thinking, how about we start with the really big picture? Um, We kind of live in an exponentially defined world, don't we? And and, uh, I'd like to start there. What what does that really mean? Why is that important? Well, I I know your listeners are familiar with exponential growth, but I think it's an important part of the puzzle to remind everyone about um, to understand the crisis we're in. Um, Garrett Hardin uh, once wrote that if you had two grams of gold growing at 5% compound rates for 2,000 years, we'd have 800 trillion golden planet Earths right now. Um, When you hear there's 100 years left of oil at current rates of consumption, that's not true if we use 5% more oil every year. It will only last for 36 years. Um, So it's really astounding that oil consumption doubled every 10 years from 1900 to the 1970s. That means every 10 years, as much oil was consumed as all the previously consumed oil. At that rate, even if the planet was a giant gas tank, oil would run out in 340 years. Um, This clearly can't end well. Um, We've been consuming more oil than we found for five decades, and last year, we only found 12 billion barrels, which is a third of what we consume every year. Yeah, and it's 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 gotten even worse than that. The um, most recent statistic is we're we're closing in on 2.6 giga barrels uh, of fines for the trailing 12 months. So really, just out of 31 billion consumed, so so less than a tenth. Um, and most people are really still unaware of this. So you have these startling, you know, statistics that I love. The exponential growth is really critical to understand, and, and we look at Um, here's a number that really worries me as well, uh, is is that 3 billion. That's the number of people who are projected to be in the middle class by 2025, so less than 10 years from now, starting from 1 billion in the year 2000. So this extraordinary uh, herd of people, of course, of course, wanting to come into the middle class defined by having a car, a house, much higher levels of consumption, and all of those take resources. And of course, oil is the master resource in this particular story. Most people still don't get that. Um, so, so just how do we get, Alice, how do you go about telling, getting people, uh, say, more aware of this water that we swim in, the oil that, that surrounds us so daily? Well, I mean, the information is out there. Um, 
there was a really interesting United Nations report that came out this month um, that uh, 200 pages, mind you, but it's full of interesting graphs and charts about how uh, from 1970 to 2010, um, we used 78 billion tons of stuff, up from 22 billion tons 40 years ago. And um, they say that to accommodate everyone and the um, billions more expected by 2050, we're going to have to triple that again, which is just insane. Um, it, it's, you know, the people who deny limits to growth say we'll just miniaturize and use less material and get more efficient. But the UN report flatly states that, in fact, the opposite is happening. We're using more material and getting less GDP out of it while dramatically increasing our damage and pollution of ecosystems. Yeah, now this is uh, something I, I uh, ah, this is such an important point to get across, and, and the ecological destruction is something that causes a lot of grief, and that's really hard for me to look at personally. I think one way to get straight to the heart for a lot of people, though, is to say, look, our current way of life is, is defined by uh, the way we have things organized. So the way we currently have things organized, and this this should be obvious. Here's why it's obvious to me. Uh, I go places and I watch what's happening. So whether I'm in Lima, Peru or Dallas, Texas or um, anywhere on the globe, I see cars. I see lots of cars. I see internal combustion engines. I have a very sharp eye looking out for hybrids and pure electric vehicles. And they are still, by my eye, uh, uh, you know, confirming what the statistics say, less, far less than 1% of the vehicles on the road. Uh, so we are still heavily addicted to uh, petroleum for transport at this point. Yes, and I don't see that changing because the vehicles that matter the most that make civilization possible are trucks, locomotives, and ships, and they all run on diesel fuel. Um, and, you know, I mean, much as I love cars, they're not absolutely essential. And we've got trillions of dollars invested in them, and the diesel engines are as much responsible for civilization as the fuel itself, according to Vaclav Smil, he thinks diesel engines are more important than computers as far as the levels we've reached. And they last 40 years. Um, those can't be replaced overnight. Uh, even, in the mo even the most optimistic person has to surely admit that there's going to be some hardship, even if you do believe that there's a solution. Now, let, before we get to that, let, let, let me unpack this. So the idea that the diesel engine is possibly more important to our current lives than, than computers. Uh, a lot of people aren't really going to have a frame of reference for that because, you know, we talk to people, I, I've talked to people who, who actually think gasoline comes out of the nozzle at the gas station. Like that's literally where it comes from. They haven't mentally connected the, the, the supply chain to go all the way back. But it's easy to, I'm not blaming people, it's easy to not notice, you know, when you pick jeans off the rack at Walmart for $12, they just magically showed up. But you have the background to, to know how they showed up. Help, help us understand what the global transportation system really involves at this point in time. Well, I worked in transportation many years, as you mentioned earlier, and um, it's, it was uh, the goal was to try to move uh, goods from point A to B just in time, um, as quickly as possible and as seamlessly as possible. And uh, so you might have, but but. It's hard, or it's so complicated, but um, let's just take a supply chain where you have hundreds of trucks arriving with bits and pieces uh, where they're assembled in China, and then fewer trucks can take it to the port. It's loaded onto the ship with uh, other kinds of trucks, including cranes, uh, shipped over, and then even if it goes on a railroad, it's when it gets off, the containers get off, they're going to need to go by truck to their final destination. So uh, even though um, ships and rail is, uh, are orders of magnitude more energy efficient, um, you still need trucks because you have 4 million miles of roads in the US, but you only have 95,000 miles of rail and 25,000 miles of ocean navigable rivers and lakes to deliver goods on. So, the, so trucks are, are critical, A, for moving at all, but, but B, for the last mile, because uh, I don't happen to live on a canal myself. Yeah, and they're also logging, mining, constructing, mm -hmm. uh, lifting, digging, um, planting crops, harvesting crops, 
Um, there's, you know, hundreds of kinds of different trucks keeping civilization going. All right. So, so let's, let's do this by, by trying to poke some holes in, in this whole idea. Um, I had a number of people recently send me a, a very, a very uh, happy uh, story about electric trucks now running in Sweden. So, of course, when I click on the links and follow the story, um, I found something different than what was being implied by people, which was, hey, look, we, we now have electric trucks. That part's been solved. But uh, what I discovered was the story was referring to a two kilometer stretch of electrified road, two kilometers. Uh, not un and it's not unlike the trolley overhead wires of the 1930s, right? There's some some wires up there, and the trucks make contact with the wires, and they have an electric engine. This is great, but it's two kilometers out of many tens of millions of kilometers of global roadway. So, uh, in a percentage term, I'd, I wouldn't even dare to calculate it. Uh, by these numbers, it seems to me that what Sweden's doing is they're really running an experiment, and possibly a quite good one to run, but a tiny experiment nonetheless, right? So, so would it be unfair for me to say? We're nowhere in the electrified truck store yet. I, yes. Um, in fact, California is ahead of Sweden. Uh, the port of Los Angeles and San Pedro to lower emissions um, is further along in a mile stretch of catenary uh, wires, overhead wires for trucks. And I recently found, uh, using uh, information published by CalStart and other entities that are uh, doing this, I, I worked out that um, if you electrified that 23-mile stretch of roadway um, to keep 10,000 drayage trucks moving between the port and inland warehouses, it would take almost 1% of all of California's electricity generation. And then you've got 7,600 more 23 miles uh, to electrify the rest of the 175,000 miles of roads. I mean, that's just clearly not doable. And you're assuming that trade along that path will continue. You're putting a lot of um, money. It's very expensive. Um, where, whereas perhaps someday you'll wish you'd done that in the Central Valley to deliver food to the cities along the coast. 23 miles would require 1% of current electricity production? In California. In California, yeah. So, and, and that's just because it. This is a pretty heavily traveled twenty-three mile chunk here, I guess. But, but that's just to show that the, the uh, these trucks are actually consuming a lot of energy doing what they're doing, right? Yes, and they have to go up some um, steep grades, which further drains their um, the energy. You know, takes more energy. All right, so. Uh, so here, here's the here's the idea I've been running into a, a lot, and this is this is what I think gets to the heart of it. So there's two big pieces we need to discuss. One is where we really are in the energy story. So I'm going to start there. Let's complete that. But then the second piece I want to get to is what really is involved in trying to get to an energy transition. And both of those pieces are are really hinted at by that one percent of total electricity consumption uh, production being consumed for a 23 mile stretch. So, but let's unpack this a little bit. In the last few years, Alice, you're aware, uh, peak oil has been declared dead uh, multiple times by the mainstream press. Where do you stand on peak oil at this point in time? Well, I think um, it, it, it's interesting um, that um, people have uh, forgotten and even denied it because uh, apparently they didn't hear former Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger speak at a Senate hearing way back in 2006 where he said, by about 2010, we should see a significant increase in oil production as a result of investment activity now underway. There is a danger that any easing of the price of crude oil will once again dispel the recognition that there is a finite limit to conventional oil. Also, many um, people who study this predicted decades ago that one of the signs of peaking would be uh, price swings, um, because there's this inevitable cycle of scarcity, putting more money in, uh, maybe going too far, uh, and the uh, price drops from that, or it goes so high that you have a depression and demand drops as businesses fold, and uh, more and more of the middle class is driven uh, into poverty. Um, I know people who can't afford to have a car anymore. Um, so this cycle... Uh, it, you know, we're in the low part of the cycle, but uh, inevitably uh, there will be some scarcities again 
to remind people. Now, this is something I've been I've been sort of beating on my drum around, which and talking with people like Arthur Berman and Kale Ferberg and other people who study this, which is is uh, and and increasingly we're seeing mainstream analyst houses come online with this, which is looking ahead a few years and noting that the trillion and a half dollars of delayed first investment decision FIDs or FIDs delayed FIDs for the for the big oil companies is going to have a real impact on downstream production at some point because you know not only are we not maintaining infill drilling nor are we exploring uh, and finding new and bringing onto the line new production uh, of oil. All of those things got delayed because all the oil that's left is really expensive. Uh, deep water, Orinoco Belt heavy oil, uh, tar sands, even shale is very expensive on average. Um, you know, starting at a minimum of 60 a barrel and progressing as high as 120 or more, depending on what we're talking about. So, so the era of cheap oil is over in terms of finding it and getting it to market. Uh, whether it's high or low in the market is, is subject to other forces. But this idea of ever more expensive oil is really hiding a much more uh, important argument, which is about the energy return we get out of that oil. How, how, do, we, how do we begin to understand uh, the, how do you go about explaining to people the energy return on energy invested? I'm always fascinated to hear how people um, convey this because to me, it's the most important idea out there. Like if I had just one that I needed to arm myself with, it would be this one. Oh, I agree. I mean, that should be the focus of scientists to de- to truly determine that and use it as a basis for where we would best spend our money on uh, projects to um, soften the hard landing ahead. Um, but the problem has always been, since the concept was first uh, invented um, partly at Stanford in the early 1970s um, and by Charles Hall, is that everyone disagrees on the boundaries. Um, so you um, end up with quite a wide range, um, and there have been um, attempts to standardize um, how studies are done to get around that problem, um, but it's still uh, not agreed upon, um, and it makes it uh, confusing for people who don't specialize in it to make any sense of the results. Uh, so, But it obviously that's what's the most important. If it takes more energy to um, make something then you get out of it, then it's dead in the water. It's an energy sink. Like uh, like hydrogen. Uh, most people uh, still will tell me that hydrogen is the way of the future. And I say, well, it's, a, it's an energy sink. That's great. Where does the primary energy source come from? Fossil fuels have been this extraordinary once in a species bequeathment. It's been astonishing. As you mentioned, because of the exponential doubling times, we are chewing through every time we double our use of something, be it oil, fossil fuels in the form of natural gas or coal, every time we double our use of that, we're actually uh, in that period consuming as much in that doubling period as was consumed in all of history prior. So anybody can work out, children can work out that that's a finite substance that's being chewed into exponentially runs out. Even if it isn't being chewed into exponentially, it's finite. It runs out. Uh, So whether or not um, we really understand the E-Roy story at 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 the micro level, the macro story has to be indisputably that oil finds today are smaller, deeper, and um, more difficult to get to than they were just 50 years ago. Yeah, I mean, that's another part of uh, what people need to understand is that um, we get we get 60% of our oil from just 500 really large oil fields that we found over 50 years ago. And uh, the ones of those that are in decline are uh, declining on average at 6%, and that will accelerate to 9% a year. Um, and since and other fields decline much faster. Giants are the slowest. This means by 2030, uh, oil could be declining at 9% a year, and we'd have to replace half to two-thirds of our oil. I just don't see how unconventional oil can make up the difference. Um, one scientist looked at a crash program to ramp up tar sands and concluded that they would peak in about 2040 at just a quarter of what America consumes today. Um, Arctic oil, which we don't know how to get, um, would take decades of development before a single drop was produced. And the tight fracked oil that's uh, bumped the numbers up a bit 
uh, since conventional oil peaked in 2005, is expected to peak by 2020, and it will decline quite rapidly after that. Well, y y yes, and, and this all seems really, really, well, for the people like us who look at the numbers, this is fairly obvious. And so what's l less obvious, though, is, look, any individual, any company, any country that really wants to end up in a more favorable place in the future has to run a strategy. And a strategy, lots of complicated ones, but they always boil down to this simple thing. You, you, you know where you're going and how you're going to get there. That's a strategy. It, it's, it's a vision and the resources you have to get there. Now, I want to turn to part B of the story, which is, which is about um, how we get there. So here's what I'm concerned about, Alice. It, 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 we're, we're busy selling F-150s and SUVs because why? Because car companies make money doing that and gas is currently cheap. So, so that's the total decision factor. But we clearly have a finite amount of, of fossil fuels to use and we're using them perpetuating the status quo, which is what the F-150 and SUVs represent to me, just a continuation of, of business as usual. But if we only have so much uh, energy in the ground, it makes sense to me that strategically we ought to be using some dedicated portion of that to build out to whatever the new energy future is going to be. So insert your favorite fantasy over here, people. Uh, do you want a whole electrified uh, future and the electricity comes from wind and solar and we have a smart grid and there's distributed cogeneration? Beautiful future. I love it. But let's be clear that it's going to take a lot of energy to get there and it'll take time and it'll take money. So time, cost, scale, all of those things get involved. How big is this challenge really, Alice? I mean, are we going to get there with market forces like some people think, or is this going to, or would it require something far more dedicated, we should say, like a national program that would rival any of the largest national programs that have ever been run? Well, um, <laughs> I'm afraid that um, in my book, When Trucks Stop Running, I, I don't see a solution um, to uh, keeping trucks running on uh, biofuels, coal, natural gas, hydrogen, or electricity. Um, I don't see how you can scale electricity up. Um, part of that is because um, you're going to mainly need to have um, energy storage batteries uh, in order to uh, capture um, excessive wind and solar, which will be the main sources of power, um, for times when there's uh, not enough wind or solar to go around. Um, Europe has looked at this, and they estimate you'd need six to 30 days of energy storage if you had a national grid encompassing all of Europe, the Mediterranean, and North America. Now, energy storage batteries are critical because there are very few places to put pumped hydro and compressed air energy storage. Um, Charles Barnhart at Star Stanford University found there simply isn't enough material in the world to store four to 12 hours of global electricity for um, all batteries but sodium sulfur. However, at this stage, um, you, and I used a Department of Energy handbook, a sodium sulfur battery would, that could store one day of US electricity would weigh 450 million tons, cover 923 square miles, and cost $41 trillion. So um, we're a long way from the um, energy storage devices that we would need. Um, and then it's such a complicated topic, it's, it's at least 10 hours to explain how the electric grid works and why it would be hard um, to have a renewable grid, which Europe and especially Germany have researched extensively. Um, and the materials to make alternative energy are staggering. Uh, just one two megawatt turbine, wind turbine, needs 1,300 tons of concrete, 300 tons of steel, 48 tons of iron, 24 tons of fiberglass, 4 tons of copper, and so on. And you need about a million of them to provide half our power. And then after 20 years, you'd have to replace them all over again. Um, so I just, I don't see how it can happen uh, for many, many more reasons I can't really um, go into. Well, that that does begin to get us a sense of the, of the really of the scale involved, and and I've run the numbers for my my audience, and they they are silly. Um, you know, we're installing something crazy good. Uh, you know, several thousand um, windmills a day across the world, but we would have to run that up to uh, thirty eight thousand 
uh, windmills per day per day uh, in order to begin to meet the, um, the sustainable uh, energy goals of the UN by just by 2030. So it's, like, rem- yeah. it's an astonishing number. It's just like, really? Uh, where would they all come from? And how would we install them that quickly? It's just a it's a staggering sort of a of a piece. And that's assuming that the wind blows and it's not intermittent and that you have some storage devices. And by the way, I, I truckled o- trunked over to the uh, DARPA site because they are investing in alternative uh, battery technologies. And it's a really nice list. They've got quinone uh, 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 ion reduction batteries, flow batteries uh, with, uh, you know, vanadium. They're, they're doing compressed air. They have all these really creative things. But when I was looking at the award amounts, Alice, they were anywhere from $50,000 to $3 million, which I consider to be chump change when we're talking about what you just described, batteries that need to are best measured in the millions of tons and tens of square miles. Uh, it, it feels like we're just not really serious about this yet uh, from a resource standpoint or a, a political priority standpoint. If you can't run trucks on electricity, what's the point? They are, that is the nub of the problem that we face. This is a liquid fuels transportation crisis and electricity does absolutely nothing to solve that problem. If you can't electrify trucks, then game over. So how much of the transportation fuel is used by trucks? What, what's, the, what's the number? It's only 20%. Um, and so we can um, get by for a long time um, by rationing and distributing it to um, agriculture. I'm sure the military will want to grab some of that. Um, and whatever's left over can go uh, to other important services. But at some point, um, it's going to be hard to keep trucks running. And I think the best thing to do is to assume we're going back to the age of wood, which was our energy resource for most of human history. And if the, a miracle happens, great, you know. Um, but fusion is really the only thing that could replace oil, and that uh, is nowhere in sight. Um, it is a mess. They're talking about uh, closing the Lawrence Livermore um, facility down. It, it's, you know, it, I don't see, it, you know, and Robert Hirsch uh, wrote a peak oil study for the Department of Energy in 2005, said you'd want to plant, plan 20 years ahead of time. But oil peaked 10 years ago, conventional oil, which provides 90% of our oil. We don't have the time. We can hope a miracle happens, but, um, you know, we should be preparing to go back to the past. Well, now that's a, a, I, I happen to agree that um, uh, the correct moment to have really begun to take a different turn was uh, during that April 1977 speech by, by Carter. Um, I, I think he had it right. <laughs> that was that would have been a great time to go, hey, uh uh, you know, let, let, we're really going to have to do things differently. So w- when I really talk about like w- what I want to do with the timescale cost to try and, and, and talk to people or if I could convince them about something would be that we're not going to continue on the same trajectory we are, meaning we're not just going to have a future that's just larger and more of the same because we figured out how to electrify the grid and store electricity. Because when you really run the numbers, the time, the scale, the cost, say we're not getting there. So what I'd love to do is get people to that point, which is not a hopeless point. Well, it's hopeless if you want the future to look like today only bigger. That's a hopeless point. Sorry. Uh, If you have that dream, I don't think it's going to happen. But we still are going to be existing in the future. And so this is where the conversation gets interesting, because I think there are lots of things that individuals can do, should do, to both be responsive to the predicament as it exists. So to me, that means using less energy today, if you can, and figuring out how to do that. And by the way, almost everybody can. But secondarily is to become um, more resilient and uh, to really understand what's likely to unfold. So in that energy constrained future, what do you, what are the, what do you, from the transportation standpoint, I would guess you would say we'll have fewer trucks moving from point A to point B. Well, what does that, what would that really mean to somebody's daily life? Well, I mean, the, the, the oil is so essential um, that it's going to also, um, co- it already has cost uh, probably peak food um, because uh, nearly all of the um, food we eat, the, pro- the Nature magazine um, two years ago has a story about how nearly all the 
food we eat that provides our calories um, peaked uh, before 2010 and most of them around 2006, uh, that means uh, achieving sustainability uh, will be hard, far harder than anyone thought. Um, and some of the food items that have already peaked are fish, meat, milk, eggs, dairy, wheat, corn, rice, and soy, um, as well as cropland, irrigated areas, peat, and nitrogen fertilizers. And it's interesting that those peaked around the same time conventional oil peaked. So obviously, I think people uh, should uh, learn how to grow uh, their own food in their backyard or a nearby community garden. Uh, the younger you are, uh, the better it would be to move to a sustainable region uh, of your country. Um, Charles Hall and John Day wrote a book about just that um, recently that came out this year on um, where the most sustainable regions of the country would be. Mm -hmm. uh, totally agree with all of that. And I would uh, go further for people who have um, investments. A lot of people do and they care. You got your 401ks or you, you're tied into a pension of some kind. Uh, you're a teacher, you're a fireman, somebody you're hoping for a pension or maybe a corporation. Or let's say you run an endowment for uh, a, a college or, or for a, a, a nonprofit of some form. Well, all of the returns that, that we've come to expect out of our financial portfolios are based on the idea of growth. And so this is a really interesting thought experiment. Alice, when I run this with, with people who do manage money, I usually get blank stares. It's kind of like dogs listening to white noise. They tip their head sideways and they don't understand what I'm saying. Because from my perspective, when we look at the role of energy in being the master resource that fosters all economic growth, um, if we take the energy away in terms of as a growth driver, we're only left with productivity. But productivity is hard to come by when you're in a long emergency or in crisis or, or otherwise not flush with all the surplus energy that funds the investments that allow us to improve our productivity. Some will, of course, always be happening. We'll get better at things. But this idea that we're going to have growth in our financial claims on things, which is just financial things, just claims on real stuff, which would be all the things you can see and touch. Um, the idea that we're going to have that sustained growth really needs to be challenged because so many people's hopes and dreams are riding on that personally, but also as a nation. I think we have this collective delusion, if I could use that word, which is that, well, when or if, Chris, we finally see you know oil become pinched in the way you think it's going to be pinched, then we'll start to get serious about it and we'll do X, Y, and Z. And, and my point would be that an energy-constrained moment in history is an incredibly poor time to try and begin doing things differently. I can't solve that at the big level, so I do shows like this, and I talk to individuals, Alice, where I say, well, that's why you need to get started on doing this yourself. Don't wait, uh, because uh, you can take control of this. And by the way, if you do, uh, I've got a garden, and I love it. Um, it's a big source of joy and quality of life for me. And uh, so these are all changes that people can make that I think will improve their quality of life. At the same time, they're being responsive to what is clearly an approaching emergency that I think has actually already started and we would detect it if we had the right lenses on uh, in uh, stubborn unemployment, in uh, declining opportunities for whole broad classes of people, um, the wild gyrations in the energy industry. These are all to me signs that that actually I talked about years ago when I put the crash course together. It all feels, this feels reasonably like we're in the in the um, uh, uh, wheelhouse of, of what the predictions would be for this period of time. And so, uh, yeah, I would I would tell people very broadly, you got to examine everything that you assume and take for granted. Take a good hard look at it and. Um, and uh, don't take anything for granted anymore. Oh, I so agree with that. Um, I, you know, I feel sorry for um, all the people who lost money in the 2008 crash, and now they're investing in really, really risky things that um, have supposedly high returns to try to make their money back, uh, one of those being high-yield uh, bond and uh, stock funds. Uh, so they inadvertently got scammed yet again by Wall Street, um, like the mortgage bubble by um, un un unknowingly investing in um, shale fracking oil and gas companies who are, who are $300 billion in debt now, uh, but they kept on drilling as long as Wall Street 
kept giving them the uh, middle class money from their 401ks and IRAs. Uh, it, it, you know, I've uh, gotten out of the stock market for many years now because I don't know when it's going to crash again. And in a, I believe it'll be deflationary, and in a deflation, cash is king. Uh, it's better to um, preserve your capital than lose it. Uh, but I see few around me uh, doing the same thing. Um, and I also think people would be wise to invest it in real things, um, like um, Dmitry Orlov and uh, Gail uh, Tverberg and others uh, recommend as a way to um, invest wisely in the future. You know, and 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 I, um, that book I mentioned about um, Holland Day uh, is America's most sustainable cities and regions surviving the 21st century. Um, to see where you might want to invest, uh, your, what money you have in real goods. Hmm. like homes and farmland and whatever. Absolutely. Uh, same advice I give all the time uh, for people in the U.S. And as well, it turns out that, you know, local mileage will vary in this story. There are other places in the world that, that seem to um, have more of a clue about these sorts of things. Sweden actually is one of them. Um, they had a, a plan to get off of all imported oil by 2020. By all standards, they seem to be uh, well on their way. So at least there's a, a group of people that have, have looked at the issue and politically were able to get, get both movement and traction on what seems to me to be a fairly obvious set of, of data. Um, and uh, so there are other places people I think can look if, if they're of a mind to really understand that, that there are better ways to do things that exist out there. You know, for, for me, it was kind of, kind of stunning that the United States looked at its, uh, uh, educational system and came up with Common Core as a response to that rather than just trundling their way over to Finland and saying, hey, what are you guys up to over here, you number one people in the world <laughs> at educating? Uh, so there are other models that exist out there. And this is the part where I do personally have some excitement and, and hope is, is seeing the bright, shiny young people who are coming out, not engaging in industrial agriculture, attempting uh, the hard work of figuring out how to make a business model out of permaculture, out of soil farming, out of uh, uh, doing things in a more relational, regenerative way rather than the isolationist, extractive ways of their parents and uh, grandparents. So, so there are lots of things out there that are being done. When I read your book, what I find is, is you know, that reconfronting the large scale numbers of all of this, where we're talking billions of people and trillions of, of, of uh, BTUs, if not quadrillions of BTUs, just giant numbers. And the scale of all that, Alice, just says there's really the only possible way we can match things up at this scale would be to be very clear-eyed, very sharp, have people taking real political risks to take us in a whole new direction. And those are the things I just don't currently see happening pretty much anywhere on the global landscape. I know when you got the right-wing going the opposite way, trying to um, prevent women from controlling their lives through birth control and abortion, and we desperately need to get the population down. Um, energy efficiency has a lot more we can do. It frustrates me everything's based on greenhouse gases uh, when uh, more energy efficiency would also accomplish that. Um, we could lower the uh, road speeds. Um, we could... Uh, the uh, Conservatives fought off uh, cafe sta fuel standards for over 30 years, which went away after when President Reagan took office. And uh, Americans aren't much better because as soon as oil prices began dropping a couple of years ago, they went out and bought SUVs and trucks again. Uh, and it's been lowering the miles per gallon, not raising it. Um, it's interesting that back when civilizations rose and fell, uh, when they used up their forests, um, maybe because um, oil's underground and we can't see it, but it was obvious to everyone that the timber was disappearing. And without them, you couldn't have warships and trade ships to get more wood uh, or expand and uh, conquer nations that still had wood. And it was considered treasonous to cut the wood down. Um, and yet it's not considered treasonous that Congress never uh, mandated fuel, better fuel standards ages ago and, and kept them um, and increased them. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty crazy system. 
So just to just to round this out, because it is a crazy system, what would what would happen if the trucks stopped running? And by the way, they could stop running for a variety of reasons. Uh, war breaks out and seriously pinches off uh, oil imports, which takes us to rationing right away. Or there could be a, a, a grid down event for a variety of reasons, uh, ranging from natural to unnatural or human made uh, and so on and so forth. But but just for context, what, what happens if trucks stop running? Well, um, within a week, um, in roughly this order, uh, grocery stores would be out of um, dairy uh, and other um, uh, items that are delivered many times a day, uh, and by the week with the shelves would be empty. Um, hospitals, pharmacies, factories, and many other businesses also get several deliveries a day, and they'd be running out of stuff the first day. Um, and uh, the second day, there'd um, be panic and hoarding, um, and restaurants, pharmacies uh, would close, ATMs would be out of money, construction would stop, there'd be increasing uh, layoffs, uh, increasing uh, enormous amounts of trash not getting picked up, uh, 685,000 tons a day. Uh, service stations would be closed, um, very few people would be working, and the livestock would start to be hungry from uh, lack of feed deliveries. Um, event, you know, within two weeks, clean water supplies would run out. Uh, within four weeks um, or to eight weeks, there wouldn't be um, coal delivered to um, power plants and electricity would start shutting down. And when that happened, um, about a quarter of our pipelines use electricity. And so natural gas plants wouldn't um, be fed natural gas and they'd start shutting down. It's a big interdependent system. That's part of the problem. It's like Liebig's law of the minimum. A plant needs about 20 different elements to grow, and you take one away, and the plant can uh, grow less or stop growing. Absolutely. So uh, this huge interdependent system is part of the reason that I think once people really look at it, um, uh, it's normal, I think, to, as a prudent adult to say, wow. That would be really a nightmare if that really shut down, and uh, and it could. Of course, the, you know the systems like this are, are a lot of nodes. They're fairly redundant for, for a variety of reasons, but they are, uh, and they're very cost efficient. But they're also not terribly resilient when you get right down to it, because they're not uh, in terms of Liebig's law. There's there's a, just a few nodes where if things broke down, um, the trucks might stop rolling. Including here's an odd one: a lot of people don't think about if the banking system tips over because there's some big derivative accidents and banks can't clear with each other, so they just have to shut the thing down until we figure it out. Letters of credit don't issue. And if letters of credit don't issue, a lot of distributors and importers, exporters can't can't operate. Um, they, it just doesn't work. So uh, there's a whole bunch of things out there that, that really could impact. But I think, you know, the summary I'd like to leave with is, is this. This is an unsustainable current operating model. Therefore, it'll stop. Someday it'll change. So in anticipation of that change, my advice is for people to begin changing on their own. Plenty of time, resources, the emotional uh, 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 adjustments that need to be made are perhaps among the most important, but there's some physical adjustments that also will take time. Lots of things people can do, but it starts with having the right information. You have to know the territory. Context is everything. And uh, so we've been talking with Alice Friedman, and her latest book is When Trucks Stop Running, Energy and the Future of Transportation. And in there, Alice has done a fabulous job of just running the numbers, and, and they're really important. So once you have those numbers, I think uh, you, you should come to the conclusion of, well, this, this is unsustainable. And then how you answer that question for yourself is, is obviously a very personal uh, decision and it all depends on a lot of factors that that are beyond our ability to understand here on this end of the microphone. So, with that, I hope you get the book and read it. And Alice, I want to thank you for your time today. I will note that I could find this book on Amazon. Is there any other place people can locate this book? I think um, Springer has it, um, Barnes and Noble, and uh, perhaps if you're near a university, you can find it there as well. Fantastic. Well, Alice, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you for having me on.